Vienna, the 29th of November, 1780. Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa is dead. Within her family's domains live more than 300,000 Jews, and for them, the news of her demise will be cause for quiet celebration. The Empress had been a staunch opponent of the Enlightenment, especially religious freedom, and most especially her ostensible Jewish subjects. But her son, the new Emperor Yosef II, has other ideas. He's seen the changes sweeping over Europe, and wherein the Jews his mother saw Austria's greatest enemy, Yosef sees Austria's greatest untapped asset. As the new emperor takes the throne, what it is to be a Jew in Europe is about to change. At the beginning of the 18th century, Brandenburg, Prussia had almost no Jewish population to speak of outside its historic capital, Königsberg. But as the kingdom steadily expanded, not only did it acquire an ever larger Jewish community through annexation, but it also began to attract Jewish immigrants. Now, Prussia at this point was basically still a feudal state, and didn't really have a concept of citizenship. Jews enjoyed permanent residency, but had significantly fewer rights than in, say, Hamburg. In the capital Berlin, Jews were only allowed to enter and exit through the same city gate reserved for cattle. So those who resettled there were generally very poor, and had little to lose by seeking out greater economic opportunities in a rising nation. And that's important for understanding the kind of person who would choose to become part of this fairly hostile new society. Because it was that spirit of resourcefulness and adaptability that would improbably make Berlin the new intellectual center of the Jewish world. In 1743, Rabbi David Frankel was appointed chief rabbi of Berlin. Although a native of the city, Frankel had spent the past several years as chief rabbi of the microstate of Anhalt Dessau, during which time he had taught and basically adopted an impoverished but extremely promising student named Moses Heimann. Heimann was only 14 when he and Frankel arrived in Berlin, but by this time he had already mastered the Torah, the Talmud, and the writings of Maimonides. In Berlin, he now received a secular education from mathematician and fellow immigrant Israel Zamosh, and took on the more German-sounding name, Mendelssohn. By 1750, Mendelssohn had mastered six languages, worked during the day as an accountant in the burgeoning silk industry, and began a side hustle as a philosopher and art critic, even daring to criticize a book of poetry written by King Friedrich himself. His work led him to a lifelong friendship with fellow critic and playwright Gotthold Lessing, and together they became fierce defenders of German language and culture at a time when it wasn't very well respected, even within the German-speaking world. Inasmuch as there was such a thing as German nationalism in the 18th century, Moses Mendelssohn was at its forefront, and it made him a celebrity across Europe. But Mendelssohn was still a rabbi, and as his fame grew, he turned his attention more and more back towards Judaism and Jewish culture. Much as he championed German as a language worthy of great art and science, he also began to do much the same for Hebrew. He envied the passion and vibrancy that it had once had as a living language, and, taking inspiration from Rabbi Mose Lutzato, he began to campaign for its revival, publishing the world's first Hebrew magazine. At first, Mendelssohn's work on Judaism languished in obscurity, but as the years went on, events began to unfold that would shift his focus within Judaism away from metaphysics and aesthetics in favor of the much more popular subject of politics. In 1763, Mendelssohn won an essay competition from the Royal Academy of Sciences for his work on the application of mathematical proofs to metaphysics. This was a huge, huge deal. The guy who came in second was Immanuel Kant. And as an added reward for his achievement, King Friedrich bestowed Mendelssohn with the legal status of Schutzjude, a protected Jew. That is to say, he was no longer subject to the discriminatory laws imposed on other Jews. Mendelssohn was not the only person to receive such a status. Friedrich made similar awards to Jewish craftsmen, publishers, doctors, and financiers on whom he depended for furnishing Prussia's military might and its cultural finery. But for all his legacy as an enlightened absolutist, Friedrich was very much someone for whom Mendelssohn was one of the good ones. The privileges of Schutzjude were notably not extended to Mendelssohn's wife or children, and Friedrich personally vetoed efforts by the Royal Academy to admit the Jew Moses into their ranks. 
Around the same time, a Swiss Protestant theologian named Johann Kaspar Lavater sought out Mendelssohn for a friendly debate that he believed would convince Mendelssohn, as a man possessed of one of the greatest minds in Europe, to see reason in converting to Christianity. Now, this was no medieval disputation. Lavater was only acting on his own behalf with an open mind, and argued not from theological doctrine, but from the Enlightenment spirit of logic and ethics. Mendelssohn would have preferred not to engage, fearing the consequences for his fellow Jews. But he also relished the opportunity to use Lavater's rationalist arguments against him. Pressed on his views of Christ, Mendelssohn happily retorted that Jesus was a fine Jew, a great moral teacher, but nevertheless a teacher steeped in the Jewish tradition, whose teachings were perfectly at home with the Jewish way of life. Lavater counted this as a win, and six years later publicly challenged Mendelssohn again in his preface to the German translation of Charles Bonnet's Philosophical Palingenesis, a book which purported to prove scientifically the truth of Christian theological doctrine. Surely, Lavater asked, if you're a student of logic and reason, and you openly admire Jesus' moral character, why wouldn't you embrace his divinity as outlined in this book? Why should I? Mendelssohn replied. I also admire Confucius and Solon, but I wouldn't feel any need for them to be Jewish. Lavater was prepared for this. Well, why not? Don't you want them to be saved? Mendelssohn had him this time. Well, Jewish teaching tells us that they can save themselves. Anyone can serve and love God if they act morally. The only thing that sets Jews apart is the particular way in which God has called upon us to serve him. Most of my friends aren't Jewish, and I've never thought less of them or that they were missing something. In Hebrew, people like you are what we call righteous among nations, because you, my friend, serve God in your own way, with wisdom and kindness, and that's just as good. Oh, and by the way, I read the book. You can do better than this. Mendelssohn's initial hesitance to engage with Lavater was not unreasonable. Recalling the recent revival of disputations by the Frankist movement, he feared that a public call to explain Jewish belief was a futile effort that would only be weaponized to promote anti-Semitic violence. But actually, the opposite happened. Although Lavater never shook his wish for Mendelssohn to become Christian, he couldn't help but admire his conviction and fairness, and their rivalry became a sort of friendship. While Mendelssohn was not the first rabbi to attempt outlining Judaism for a Gentile audience, it was the first time that a large audience was interested in listening. This was most educated Europeans' first exposure to Jewish belief from a Jewish perspective, and it challenged a lot of cultural assumptions about Jews and Judaism that even most Enlightenment thinkers had taken for granted, the impact of which carried directly into the next phase of Mendelssohn's career. Since childhood, Mendelssohn had suffered from scoliosis and arrhythmia, the complications of which were exacerbated by stress. And after suffering what may have been a stroke in 1771, he resolved to spend whatever was left of his life in the pursuit of Jewish emancipation, the growing pan-European movement to make Jews equal citizens of their home countries. In this effort, Mendelssohn had no shortage of allies. His friend Lessing had publicly advocated for emancipation as far back as the 1740s, and Lavater had gone on to successfully lobby against the expulsion of Jews from Switzerland. In fact, the movement for Jewish civil rights at this time was dominated by non-Jews, and you might already see how that could be a problem. As a Jew, and a rabbi at that, Mendelssohn had a unique insight into the Jewish perspective on emancipation that most of his colleagues lacked. In particular, that Jewish emancipation would be just as challenging for Jewish society as it was for the rulers of Europe. And in this, he took inspiration from German Jewry's most provocative and exciting voice. Jakob Emden. Vindicated for his work against Mr. Frank and the Sabbateans, Rabbi Emden made no attempt to quell the radicalism for which he had been previously shunned. In 1768, Emden published an exhaustive analysis of the Zohar, the foundational text of the Kabbalah, in which he concluded that the commentary was not a lost work of the second-century Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, as it claimed to be, but a medieval Spanish forgery and thus alongside the Vilna Gaon opened the doors for serious textual criticism within the scope of Jewish orthodoxy. Granted, not all of his ideas were winners, 
He was also an outspoken proponent of polygamy, and denounced Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed as a forgery purely out of disdain for its Aristotelian leanings. But towards the end of his life, it was his views on Jewish emancipation that had taken center stage, and made Mendelssohn his favorite disciple. Emden believed that Christianity and Islam were part of God's plan for the Jewish people, that the three religions shared common values and goals, and that it was only the antiquated system of legal segregation that had pitted them against each other. Mendelssohn took it a step further to say that even when Jews had been given maximum legal autonomy, like in Poland, it had just been a license for rabbinic authorities to substitute a Jewish dictatorship for a Gentile one. One only had to look at the oddly anachronistic clothing worn by Jews in Poland at the time. True, Hasidim were deliberately dressing in unique styles to stand out from their fellow Jews, but even the Vilna Gaon and other opponents of Hasidism were still wearing stremels, kaftans, long beards, the fashions of 200 years earlier. And this didn't have any basis in Jewish law, it was just the result of reactionary clothing bans imposed by local rabbis over the centuries. If Emden had found the problem facing Europe's Jews, Mendelssohn believed he had found a solution in the liberalism of John Locke. Citizenship, freedom of conscience, and the separation of religion and state. In Western Europe, Jewish communities were already giving him the name the Third Moses, and his ideas would form the foundation of the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. In Mendelssohn's calculation, religion was an inner power, outside the confines of Locke's social contract between citizens and government, and to which those citizens had no inherent responsibility. Jews could choose to abide by the judgments of Jewish courts, but Jewish courts couldn't make it so. Mendelssohn idealized the achievements of the Sephardic Golden Age, of figures like Chastai ibn Shaprut and Samuel ibn Nagrela, who had exemplified the best of Judaism while also transcending it to lead the predominantly Gentile states in which they lived. Only through the abandonment of religious coercion, Mendelssohn believed, could Europe's Jews finally return to that maximum potential. In turn, states which oppressed Jews only had themselves to blame for perpetuating the sorry state of the communities that drove their hatred, and could only benefit from emancipation. They tie our hands and reproach us for not using them. But ironically, as much as Mendelssohn's writings flattered the enlightened absolutism of King Friedrich, it was Friedrich's rival, Joseph II of Austria, who would be the first to take up these ideas. During her reign, Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa had been an outspoken anti-Semite. In 1745, the British ambassador reported with horror how she would order cities in her realms to hide their Jews when she visited, lest she risk even seeing one. Two years later, in the midst of the War of the Austrian Succession, she ordered the expulsion of tens of thousands of Jews from Bohemia before backing down under the threat of sanctions by her own British and Dutch allies. And in 1777, she succeeded in banishing Jews from the capital, Vienna. But with her death in 1780, her son Joseph II took the throne and everything changed. Today, Joseph is remembered mostly as a patron of Mozart, but he was one of the most important leaders of 18th century Europe. His sweeping reforms far outshined the reactionary policies of his mother, and few people felt those changes more than his Jewish subjects. Between 1781 and 1785, Joseph II issued the Edict of Tolerance across his various territories. The edict ended the ban on Jews in Lower Austria and abolished extra taxes and fees on Jews throughout the Habsburg lands. It additionally liberated Jews from having to wear identifying clothing, allowed them to learn any trade they wanted, own their own businesses, and attend Austrian universities. In 1788, Jews were made eligible for conscription into the Austrian army, and the following year, they were awarded full citizenship, with the rights to vote in local elections, buy land, and be ennobled. This wasn't without its trade-offs. Most Jews in the Habsburg lands lived in Galicia, a territory only recently annexed from Poland, and in order to discourage any lingering loyalties to Poland, Jews in rural areas were mostly forced to relocate to urban districts alongside German settlers. But ultimately, it was worth it. Instead of relying on an unqualified Baal Shem to go from town to town teaching Torah to children, the poorest Jewish community in Europe now had equal access to the same education and the same job opportunities as middle-class Austrians back in the capital. And if state schools refused Jewish students, 
the emperor would provide qualified teachers for Jewish schools. In a single generation, Galician Jews went from being the poorest and least educated Keila in the former Polish territories to the wealthiest and most educated. In the city of Ternopil, 14-year-old Josef Perl ended his studies to become a Hasidic Rebbe and began to study the topics that would lead him to become the leading figure of secular Judaism in Austria, a ferocious satirist of the Hasidic movement and a leading figure in the revival of the Hebrew language. But even with this success, some of Mendelssohn's ideas were not so warmly received. Back in 1772, the small duchy of Mecklenburg-Schwerin became seized with panic over the questionably real issue of premature burial. This particular phobia has come and gone throughout the centuries, with varying consequences. But when the duke issued a decree requiring that dead bodies must wait a day before being buried, the small Jewish community there sought help from Emden, who referred the issue to Mendelssohn. See, it's traditional for Jews to bury their dead as quickly as possible. Jewish law affirms that the soul isn't at peace until the body is buried, and thus an unburied body can never be left unattended. If it is left unattended, that's when you call the rabbi and tell him to cancel the eulogy and instead get ready for an exorcism. This still happens. Mendelssohn was quickly able to negotiate a compromise with the duke whereby bodies could be buried on the day of death, provided that the next of kin was able to secure a death certificate within that time. But unsatisfied to let things lie, he criticized the principle of the issue to Emden. Surely, Jewish law commands us to preserve life and to honor God's creation. Is that not then a commandment to love science? If one could not rule out the possibility of premature burial, would it not honor God more to ensure the safety of the living? Mendelssohn pointed out that Jews in the time of the temple didn't immediately bury their dead. They only interred them in communal caves for three days and then buried them. Perhaps this practice could be revived. Mendelssohn knew that Emden would probably disapprove, and Emden did not disappoint. And although Emden would continue to correspond with Mendelssohn, his affinity for the young rabbi dissipated. He died four years later. Mendelssohn's final years were littered with tragedy. Two of his children predeceased him. So too did his friend Lessing whose reputation was subsequently dragged through the mud by fundamentalist detractors. Rabbinic authorities across Central Europe lambasted him as a heretic to even suggest abandoning the coercive power of the courts. And at the same time, Mendelssohn's own students and followers, the Maskilim, grew frustrated with his dogged commitment to Jewish orthodoxy, instead proposing far more radical departures from the tradition. And then there was the issue of emancipation. In Prussia, it had been a total failure. In 1783, the Dublinches Theater debuted Lessing's posthumous work, Nathan the Wise, a parable for Jewish emancipation set during the Third Crusade, which was ridiculed by audiences and condemned by conservative Catholics. Mendelssohn may have closed the gap between Jew and Gentile in the parlors and coffee houses of Berlin, but not among the general public. On the 4th of January, 1786, Mendelssohn's heart troubles finally overtook him. He died unemancipated, free not by his rights as a citizen, but by the backhanded favor of his king. The situation was similarly grim elsewhere. Britain had attempted to emancipate its Jews as far back as 1753, but the bill was repealed just a year later due to an unexpected and humiliating public backlash. Even the reforms in the Habsburg lands didn't fully go into effect until 1789. So in truth, Mendelssohn never lived to see a time in which Jews were regarded as equal and unseparate members of a modern society. In Europe. He never lived to see that time in Europe. Special thanks to my patrons including Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, Jay Fleischman, Osha Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Eric Liederman, and Sergei Gerasimov. <laughs>